Hey, Trevor, what's up, man? Welcome to Dad Edge, my friend. Hey, Larry. Great to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, well, it's it's great to see you. It's it's good to finally meet you face to face. And uh, we're going to be talking about a topic that is uh, that, that I think is rare, very, very rare. But actually, as I look at the stats, though, it's not so rare. You know, right. There's a lot, there's a lot of men uh, who are dealing with, you know, the cancer, you know, yeah. in, in, in between the ages of, of 25 and 50 now. Absolutely. All over the place. So I, I would love for you just to introduce yourself and uh, just give any background that you would like to share. Yeah, sure, man. I mean, so I am, uh, I'm 47 years old. I was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer six years ago when I was 41. Um, and, and the, <clears throat> excuse me, the most important thing I want everyone to know about me is that I am so proud to be a dad. Like being a dad is, is really the, that's the first thing I would say when I'm introduced to someone is that I'm a proud father of two girls. I know that you got uh boy life in your household, but, uh, it's girl life over here. So proud father of two girls. And, um, yeah, I live here in the great state of Maine, right on the Atlantic coast with my, uh, high school sweetheart. We started going out when we were 16 and now we're in our mid forties cruising toward 50, um, Sarah. So shout out to Sarah. I'll talk about her a lot this show because without Sarah being my rock and really supporting us in ways that I never could have imagined, I don't, I definitely wouldn't be here to talk to you. I wouldn't be alive today. Um, wow. so yeah, so, so being a family man, first of all, um, with Sarah and Sage and Elsie are my girls. And, um, <clears throat> so yeah, my background is really just, um, communications person. I was a journalist for many years, um, writing about other people. Um, then I did some public relations communications and then middle of my life, just kind of at the prime of my life, I got hit with, um, stage four cancer and that completely changed the trajectory of my life and everything I do. Um, and now I, I founded, um, a support community for other men going through all types of cancer called man up to cancer. And that's where, where I put my professional passion into. Um, so really life these days is about soaking up as much as I can with my family, um, doing all the bucket list stuff because I still have a terminal prognosis, um, do, doing all the trips, all the fun stuff. Um, and then focusing my professional work on really helping other men, going through the journey. Wow, man. I, I got to tell you, first of all, I just want <clears throat> to really acknowledge and appreciate you, man. Thank you. Bro. And the reason for that is because you could have every excuse in the world not to do something, you know, not, not to start a nonprofit, not to start a community, not to support right. other people, right? You just go, go inward. Uh, but instead you're giving, which I'm fascinated by that. You know, what is it, what is it that's in you that, that motivates you and drives you to do this. Well, it's interesting. You mentioned that going inward because that's how my story really started was, well, first of all, it was shock. Just had no frame of reference for cancer coming at me at 41. Like I hadn't, you know, it was a complete life asteroid as I like to call it. Um, but I, I actually did go inward. So I struggled mightily with depression, anxiety, especially like the first year after diagnosis you know, I, I felt like I was going to die and leave my girls behind, leave Sarah behind. And, and with colon cancer, which is on the rise for people under 50, but I had never really, I had never heard of that at, at a young age. I thought it was an older person's disease and the survival statistics are bad. Of course, the first thing I do is go on Google and realize that for stage four colon cancer, the percentage of people who live to even five years is less than 15%. So I was looking at 85 plus percent of being dead within five years with daughters who were 12 and 10. And I always say like going through all the physical stuff I've gone through in the past six years is absolutely nothing compared to the emotional burden. And I, it, it really just took me into a deep, dark place. And so you, your question really made me think of that because looking back, I had to go through that. I had to go through that crucible, that, that darkness of, of just feeling like, you know, at rock bottom for me to climb out and now help those who are in that place. You know what I mean? Like I wouldn't be able to do this work if I wasn't there on my knees, you know, feeling like I'm going to die, checked out a life. 
to be able to talk to other guys who feel that way. And at the time I thought I was the only one who felt that way. That like, that's what I realized. Like I thought guys were supposed to just be handle it, you know, be strong, be, you, you know, you're not supposed to have those kind of mental health problems when you go through a challenge. And I felt shame. Um, but I had to do that to do the work I do. Wow. And I'm so curious. Did, did life start to feel better with community? Yeah, absolutely. And if you don't mind, I'll take you back before that because yeah. part of that um, initial first year, kind of like just complete shock into kind of despair. Um, and I checked, I did like the guy thing, right? I just kind of, I felt like I was a burden to my family. I felt like I, they'd be better off if I just went off into the woods and disappeared, right? Like I, I'm 41 and I'm stage four and I'm probably not going to live. And I'm just all, everything just felt like it was coming down on top of me. And I felt emasculated, you know, as a dad specifically, like our girls were 12 and 10. And, and as a dad, you're supposed to be there for them. You're supposed to protect them. You're supposed to, you know, and I'm, I've always been a super hands-on dad, like super active, very hands-on. And then all of a sudden I go to a place of being incapacitated, um, physically and emotionally. And that was horrible. It, it was just like, <clears throat> and I remember, you know, my dad and like other guys coming over to mow my lawn and, and like stack our wood and like all the stuff that I'm, you know, I'm a very physical person. I, I really embrace physicality and all that work and stuff. And all of a sudden I'm, you know, on the couch or in the bed, like sick from chemo or sick from a surgery. And so <clears throat> it, it very much was an emasculating process. And the pop culture representation of guys going through cancer is one of <clears throat> it's it's uh it's toxic positivity really like you just you see these guys in magazines or on the tv or in books and stuff just like they're they're going through cancer and they're running 5ks and they're raising money and they're working full time and they're like these superheroes and that wasn't me man like i was on the floor and on the couch and just i was out of and, and so that like was a spiral of like shame like here i was getting cancer and I felt like I was failing in responding to it. And later on, of course, through my work, I, I've learned that that is a very normal response to getting a freaking terminal diagnosis, right? Like th that emotional piece, like a lot of guys go through that, but not a lot of guys talk about it. Not a lot of guys will show you that. They'll, they'll you know, and, and society wants to focus on, you know, how brave these people are and how positive they are. Well, I can tell you firsthand that sometimes going through cancer, um, is a shit show and it's a mess and, and you're a mess and being able to actually talk about that openly is something that I didn't see. Um, so, so yeah, so that was kind of emasculating. Like, um, I wasn't working all that stuff. And then there was a, <clears throat> there was really a critical point in my journey where I had that Shawshank moment. That's what I call it. Like, you know, get busy living or get busy dying. And that was really when um, it, it was like December of that first year I had gone through chemo, I'd gone through a surgery, but I, I'm basically incurable and I was checked out and my wife, thank God for some tough love from my wife because she just kept challenging me like, Hey, like whether, you know, there was one night around Christmas, I was checked out. I was crying as a mess. And she's like, and, and I just said, I just can't get over the fact that I think they're going to remember me as sick, like the girls that I'm going to die. And they're just going to remember their dad as being sick, you know, with chemo and everything else. And Sarah looks at me, she has this look like, I'm going to say something that's going to be hard for you to hear. <laughs> and I'm I like, know that look too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, bring it on. Like, what do you got? I can't get any lower than this. And she says, I'm not worried they're going to remember you as sick. I'm worried they're going to remember you as sad. Ooh, and every time I tell it, it takes me right back there because I'm not a sad person, right? Like I've always been a happy, you know, outgoing person and cancer had really turned me into right inside of myself. And so her challenge to me was like, you know, whether you're around for another year or 20, we need you here with us. You know, we need you engaged in life. We need, we need the Trevor that we know. And that was just like, 
basically a wake up call. And, and, and I couldn't snap my fingers. And I told her this, I was like, it took me a long time to get into this pit, <clears throat> you know, this mental health pit where I'm at. It took me a while to get here. And so it's not going to be overnight that I get out, but I'm going to make you a promise. And that promise is every day from now on, I'm going to do something to help me get out of this place and to get back no matter what my life span is to get back to this family, be back to being the dad I want to be, be back to being the husband I want to be. And that was really the turning point. And to your question, this is a long, long winded around your question of getting that help. Right. But that's where a lot of guys struggle is like that point where I realized that I was in this pit and I could not climb out on my own. I was going to need others to help me out of it. And I think that's where a lot of us, you know, accepting help, right? Reaching out for help, not being, having that not be a, uh, you know, a a negative, but a positive, right? Like I want to be here for my people. I want to be here for my wife and kids and, and I need some help with this, (laughs) like hurting big time. Um, and so that was when I started going to counseling. Uh, going to group, uh, there was a local group at the Dempsey center, which is a, a amazing resource here in Maine, um, founded by Patrick Dempsey that offers therapy, individual therapy, group therapy. I just started talking to others who were going through it. I started meeting people online, um, through colon town, this awesome place for colon cancer patients. Um, other places where, you know, I realized I wasn't alone and having those conversations with other younger, younger people raising kids while cancering, um, <clears throat> And, and that is really when my life started to turn around was through reaching out, getting help, talking to others, engaging, like, and I slowly started to, even though my cancer, um, has been a continuous battle with all these surgeries and all this treatment for six years, my mental health, I started climbing out of that pit and being able to face it the way I wanted to face it and really re-engaging with my family and my community. And that was the game changer for my cancer journey. And that is where man up to cancer, really the idea for it came from because <clears throat> in all of those spaces, everywhere where I went for help, um, online in person, it was always 75, 80% women accessing those supports. Right. Um, you know, and, and I just, I'd go to these, I'd go over to the Dempsey center and sit and, and talk about it with like, 12 women and one other dude. (laughs) And it was like, and I was fine with that. Like, because my, I was forced into it. Like I had no choice. I would go and just like talk to these people about what was going on with my cancer. And like, I needed it. But I realized like one of two things was true. Either I'm just like a freak guy and, and very few guys actually struggle with the emotional burden of like a, a, a cancer diagnosis. Or there's all these guys out there who just do not feel comfortable accessing these resources, especially going to like a co-ed group. Um, and I, I, I had a feeling that it was the second one, but that was where I went from feeling ashamed and, and feeling like I was just weak to realizing that there's thousands, there are thousands of guys going through cancer, especially younger guys who are facing that, you know, they're raising kids, they're going through cancer who are really going through some tough emotional shit. And they don't have a place to vent about that or put it. And so that was kind of the genesis of like where the work that I do today came from, but absolutely community engaging, reaching out, meeting others, getting out of that isolation saved my life. Yeah. We, we always say in our community that isolation is the enemy of excellence and no matter what it is that you're going through, being a part of community will literally be the division between a life where your your children will look at us as overwhelmed or angry or sad and they they know that they feel that energy and then as Goosebumps, soon as we man. yeah yeah and as soon as soon as we step into the the key though as you well know is like-minded individuals right, right? who have similar vision similar goals and and they want to learn and they also want to contribute and I'm so curious what, after you started basically participating in community community and not isolating, what was the ripple effect and the feedback from Sarah and from your girls? What, what differences did they see? <clears throat> Huge differences right away. Um, you know, I, I really went from a person who was checked out 
to becoming myself again. Um, you know, it, it wasn't too long. You know, once you start getting that help you need, it, it doesn't take too long to get out of that pit. Even though you, when you're in the pit, you think you're never going to get out. You know, I told my counselor, Patty, like, I'd be like, just broken, totally broken in her room. And she'd be like, you will, you will come out of this. <laughs> you know, she held that space for me when I couldn't hold it for myself. Um, so, you know, it was a celebration really, you know, I mean, the, the burden for them, of course, has been difficult, you know, like they know that, I, okay, I'm going in for another surgery. I'm going in for more treatment. Like cancer has been relentless, but at least they could see that through that all, I was back to being an engaged dad, you know, rides to everything they could ever think of, you know, the softball, the music, the, you know, up to the school and everything else. Um, you know, going to everything and, and, and really it, it was huge. It really restored our family. And, and I got to say like, <clears throat> outside of the help that I got from others outside of our home, like our daughters, you know, sometimes, well, you know, we've been pretty upfront with them the whole time appropriately for their ages, but we never lied to them. You know, we, we would answer their questions appropriately because they're smarter than we think. And they, they pick up on everything. And, um, and really Elsie and Sage just lifted me up. You know, you, you think you're supposed to lift your kids up all the time. Well, sometimes it's, it's the opposite and that's okay. Yeah. Like they really lifted me up in a, in a time when I really needed, needed to be there. And then it just felt so good to, to get back to parenting, to being a dad, to, to doing all the things that, that I love to do. I think that's so important. And it's, it's hard for most of us men to allow our kids to lift us up and it's it but we're also robbing them of the opportunity to do something that they i mean they're always going to remember that can, can i share a story with you absolutely please and by the way i want to preface this with an unbelievable amount of respect for you like the story i'm going to share is an absolute like breadcrumb of what it is that you're going oh, through no, so man. we all face our own everything. stuff man yeah I just, um, I was in a similar situation with my son, meaning a uh, similar situation of, I didn't want my kids to have to ever lift me up. Right. Like I thought it was weak. Right. And I've got a book that's coming out on May 28th. It's it, that's the preview, but it's going to be launched on Father's day. It's called the spirit of fatherhood. It's a uh, Christian based view on fatherhood. And I'm new to my faith. I'm new to my Christianity faith and I've, I've been doing it since 2020. So awesome. Um, the book is pretty much all about that. It's not preaching from a pulpit. It's more like stories and, and, and how do, how do, where, where does our foundation come from and that kind of thing. So the story that I'll share with you is I went through a, a really bad knee injury like six months ago. And again, nothing compared to what you did, but, but the, the, the kid up, uplifting you is, is what I want to really highlight. I was, bleeding him internally in my joint in my knee joint for 12 Oof. weeks and they couldn't figure out why. And they started like the concern was, is, Hey, this is more than just a knee injury. Like we're really concerned that you have a, a, a blood disease or we're worried you have, you know, bone cancer or something like, cause it's not normal what it is that you're going through. So then like you, I went on to Google and I'm like Googling all this stuff and all these horror stories of people like, well, if you can't get the bleeding to stop, you're going to lose your leg. And, you know, or you've got like this, whatever disease, right? You go to, you go to Google and it's going to scare you. And I'll never forget sitting outside with my son. And this was before I Googled a bunch of things. And, and he asked me a question. He's like, what do you, what do you admire about me most as your son? And it was interesting. I was like, honestly, it's, I think I admire how excited you are, like how you embrace your faith as a teenager. Like, you know, you're, you're serious about prayer and you're, you're, you're always asking questions and, you know, you're so curious. And, and I just, I, I, when I was 17, 18, I mean, when I was 45, I wasn't <laughs> doing that stuff like, right. But you are. And I told him that. And then I, you know, after a while I was in a ton of pain, like I was in chronic pain. I went, I was like, Hey, do you mind if I just, I'm going to go to bed early. And so I started Googling and I'm in my room. My wife's not in there Googling all this stuff. And I'm like, Oh my God. And like, just tears are coming down. And my son comes back in the room to say good night. And he's like, Hey, are you okay? And I'm like, and I just, you know, do the, I'm like, I'm fine. And he's like, no, you're not. I'm like, I'm dude, I'm fine. Like I literally tried to play it off. Like, like he's an idiot. Right? right. Right. And, um, and he sits down next to me on the bed 
And he's like, dad, what's going on? And I was like, son, I was like, I gotta be honest, man. I'm just scared. I was like, no one, no one can give me any answers of what's going on. My pain in my knee is only getting worse. I was like, I'm afraid I'm gonna lose my leg. I'm afraid something's really bad going on. And I was like, and to be honest, I'm, I'm really freaked out. And he goes, do you mind if I pray for you? Do you mind if I pray over you? Which is really uncommon in our house. Like we'll pray together, but no one prays over anybody. And I at first said, I was like, no, man, I'm good. And I don't know what it is that was in me, but I was like, no, no, no. You know what? I would appreciate that because I was sitting there thinking like, for some reason I was like, I'll give him, give him this opportunity. Don't steal this away from him. Right. He's, he's offering this. And he grabbed my hand, he closed his eyes and he just started saying this prayer. And I wrote about this in the book of the coolest thing. One of the coolest things that I got to experience being on the other side of that is I would do that with him, tucking him in for, you know, 15 years right? Like sitting on the edge of his bed, talking to him about his day, you know, being the dad to him, that kind of thing. Yeah. And in that moment, I didn't see my son. I saw a young man and the father that he's going to be comforting his kid. And to see him from that view and, and to receive what he gave me was one of the most insanely beautiful gifts I think I've ever accepted, but I didn't want to do it at the time but I'm so glad now that I did kind of like you. And I, I'm, I'm so curious, what, what are some examples or do you have a story of, of allowing, you know, your daughters to, to, to pour into you a bit? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, and that's a beautiful story because I mean, look at the lessons. There's so much that was taught in that moment, you know, teaching him not to bottle up what he's feeling. Right. And this is generational stuff, right. As men, like, you know, your instinct is to like, I'm gonna keep it in. I don't want to show him this. Right. Um, but it brought you closer. It did. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, well, thank you for sharing your story. Yeah, absolutely. It's I mean, and, and so, I mean, one story that I can share with you is <clears throat> our, our younger daughter, Elsie, <sighs> um, during the time when I was really struggling emotionally, you know, the whole house felt it, you know, but it was kind of like the elephant in the room. Like we weren't really, we weren't talking about it. it. It was just, everyone knew, but it was, it was just tension and sadness, really just sadness. And, um, and again, it's, it's sometimes hard to look back on that because feeling like that's not okay, but you know what? It, it, it was the, we had to go through that again. So Elsie was, you know, I think she had turned 11 years old and she, one day, you know, she had bottled all this up and one day at home, she just, um, she just let go of all that emotion. She, she just said, she kind of had like this freak out moment and she's like, we, it, everyone's so sad, you know, everyone's so sad in here. Like we, we need to be happier. Like, why can't we be happier? And it was like this, whew, um, this is this moment where she was just like really expressing like how this was impacting her. And, and that was another turning moment. It was like, again, like another call out from my family to, to face what I was going through emotionally and to, to, to hey, get better. And she put together, uh, she, she like, she's a great artist and, and she cut out all of our um, photos from a, from a family photo and put us in this hot air. She put a hot air balloon above us and, and she, she wrote, um, she wrote up, up and away. Um, with our family on that and us smiling and like, you know, it's just really hard. It's really hard, you know, to feel joy and, and have that family happiness when you have the weight of a stage four diagnosis over you and like uh, anticipatory grief. Um, and they were feeling that too. And, you know, and we put this up on our wall and, um, it just made it part of our story. And, um, you know, again, that was hard for me to, uh, to accept that, to accept that, you know, cause I felt guilty. I felt, you know, I know it wasn't my fault that I got cancer. You know, it wasn't, I didn't do anything health wise. Like I just, I, I, 
drew the card, right? Like I was a healthy guy, like very normal for my generation. And, um, I knew it wasn't my fault, but I felt guilty, especially with the girls, like that I was putting them through this, you know, that, that I was putting them through this thing that was just such a burden. And they had to really teach me like, you know, to like, let go of that guilt, you know, like, Hey, you didn't ask for this. You, you didn't ask to get sick. You didn't ask to, you know, have to go through this with kids at an early age. And we're here for you too, you know? And I think there's just those parallels of like having to accept my young girls almost becoming caregivers in a way at a young age was very difficult, but it has made them already <laughs> so much more resilient and empathetic and kind and smart and like these challenges in life like yeah it sucks everyone wishes that dad wasn't going through cancer anymore but man for like the rest of their lives they're going to be able to to have so much more understanding of what other people are going through and people going through cancer and like so the gifts there there are gifts if you're willing to receive them of having this kind of illness in your family and so i i really have started to especially as they're older now and I have a freshman in college and, and the, and a junior in high school. And like, I just see like how far ahead they are of their peers. Like so many other peers just focused on this trivial crap and like, you know, life's so hard cause you know, they didn't get the app they wanted. Right. And our kids are just like, you know, life's pretty freaking sweet. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, it is a lot, it is a lot to like get through that guilt. Sometimes I still grapple with it. Um, but I, I also do realize that, and especially what I wanted to do with man up to cancer and my work was for them was to show them that life is going to punch you in the face. Like whether it's cancer or something else, you are going to get knocked down for sure. And I, they're always going to remember no matter how long I live, they will always remember that dad got punched in the face. He was broken for a little bit and then he got back up and did something to help thousands of people. And and I've made them proud and I know how proud they are of me that I've been able to do that. And they know their part in that too. Um, so I think that's the biggest like redemption piece of this is just like the work that I do is to show them how they can respond to a challenge. I, I love that lesson, man. And you're so right. I mean, even when our kids go through really horrific times, right? It's, um, you know, there's no promise of a pain-free life. You know, and, and our, our wounds and our struggles will actually, if, if allowed by us to become someone else's strength, you know, someone else's light in the darkness. Yeah. What have, um, as, as far as your, your mission yeah, and what you want to do in the, in the impact you're making, you're, you're impacting thousands of people and through, through this incredible mission, this man up to cancer. Yeah. You know, what is your what is your vision for this? Like what, like, yeah. what, do you, what do you, what do you want this to be? And, and what do you want this to serve? I mean, really what I want this to be is, is a change of culture. I like, I, I really do and feel like I am helping to change the way men go through cancer. And what I mean by that is in the past, when a man got diagnosed with cancer, it was very private. Like they weren't supposed to talk about it. The family didn't talk about it in general, in general, like a lot of this was, you know, it was very common for you're supposed to just not burden others, you know, get back up on that horse, like, uh, handle and really handle the challenge on your own. Like there's this concept of like this, this like rugged individualism where you get this problem and you just deal with it. And I just think that's crazy. It's, it's like, we don't go to war individually. We don't build homes individually. We don't, we don't do anything as men. Like we don't do anything worth doing totally individually. Most of the time, like most of the time we're doing it with our brothers. And that is what man up to cancer is all about. It's like, Hey, let's we're facing the same challenge. We're walking the, the same hard road. Wouldn't be, wouldn't we be a lot better if we did it, you know, together, like, as a pack, if we could lean on each other, if we could share that burden. So really it's normalizing the shared burden of cancer rather than I have to carry it all by myself. I got my buddies who are going through it too, and I'm supporting them. They're supporting me. 
and and that's really and so it's not rocket science it's it's really just peer to peer support and normalizing that for men wow i mean well you're doing a fantastic job can you can you share um how many people are part of your group <clears throat> yeah so i i started the community um really january 1st 2020 so just before the pandemic i didn't know what zoom was at that point uh <laughs> Got to know that Everybody, pretty well. Everybody's an expert now. <laughs> yeah. Um, and at and so four years later, a little more than four years later, we have we have about twenty five hundred members. Um, so these are men who either are patients or survivors. Um, we have a, we have some caregivers, so men who are caring for a spouse or a partner going through cancer. Um, and they are spread out all over. So we have about. 40, a little over 40 local chapters acro across the U.S. and Canada. Um, so odds are there's a chapter in your area if you're interested in, in linking up with us. Um, so we really, the, the heart of our peer-to-peer -peer is our is our Facebook group at this point. That's where we have like the 2,500 guys. Um, so U.S., Canada, and then we have pockets, little smaller pockets around the world. Um, but really we do three programs and they're, they're pretty simple. The first is we have the largest and most awesomest uh, men's cancer retreat in the world. Uh, we started it a couple years ago with just 55 of our guys coming. The next year we had 110. This year we'll probably be close to 200. Um, so this is an in-person retreat, you know, where we're, for those who can drink alcoholic beverages, we're having beers and we're playing cornhole and we're shooting hoops and going in the pool. And just, it's like a, just a retreat for guys like us who are like me, who are going through cancer. And, um, so that's our first program, which I, I just love. Um, secondly, we have the chapters. So guys in the local chapters will get together like in person. They'll go out to a ball game or get dinner, um, meet up in person, also meet up on Zoom. Um, so we have Zooms all the time for our chapters and our and our main group. Um, and then the third program we have is Chemo Care Backpacks. I love this program. We send out about 20 backpacks a month right now. We're going to scale that to to guys in our community who are going through chemo or immunotherapy or surgeries. And these backpacks are just filled with comfort items, practical items, things that a guy would want going through chemo. Um, and, and really that's it. So it's, it's pretty simple. We don't do treatment advice or treatment guidance because we're all cancers. We have like 50 plus cancer types represented in our, in our community. So really it's all about peer to peer support, making sure that people know they're not alone. Um, and, and I guess, yeah, that's, that's really the vision for it is again, just to encourage guys to avoid that isolation back to the isolation word. Right. So as a journalist, as a former journalist, I, when I realized how men were not engaging in cancer resources and support groups, I just dove into the, into the studies and into the science on it. And I came up with the three most important things. Um, so for, for someone who isolates going through cancer, you have higher rates of depression, anxiety, mental health struggles, uh, substance abuse. You have higher rates of divorce and relationships breaking up. And here's the kicker. If you're isolating going through cancer, you have uh, worse medical outcomes. And, and all this is, is proven across the board. So, And I'm sure you know, right? You, you, you're a, you study this isolation stuff too. You, you know the negative consequences of it. And so this is not just like a kumbaya, like let's all get together thing. Like there is hard science behind being part of a community. Um, and ours just happens to be for guys going through cancer. Um, so we tell people all the time, it's like, you know, if you're in your man cave, if you're just isolating while you're going through this, there's serious consequences. I think there's serious consequences for men to isolate, even when they're not going through something horrific. Love that. In fact, yep. I, I think it's, um, it's one of the most proactive medications that we could give ourselves is, is to be in community of, I mean, listen, I mean, I know my life changed incredibly when I started diving in the community of 2000, in 2015. Like it was almost like all the answers to all, all my questions were answered within the group yeah. of men that I surrounded myself with. And that was like, and when things went bad, I had a place to go. And when things went good, I had a place to go. When I wanted to learn, I had a place to go. And when I wanted to contribute, I had a place to go. So this is, it's uh, everything you're saying is, is very much, there's a lot of parallels, right? Between the, the dad community, the, the cancer guy community, 
all those values and, and the benefits are so clear. Can you, uh, I I'd love to wrap up. Um, and by the way, we're going to have all, all your links in the show notes here. So if, if you guys would like to connect with Trevor, you'll, you'll absolutely be able to, if you go to the dad edge.com forward slash Friday, one, five, one for this show. But I want to wrap up, um, this show talking about Sarah, if that's okay. (laughs) Yes, please. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, marriage is hard period. You know, it's, it's not easy. It's not a cakewalk. And when you go through seasons or you go through life altering events, it can really, really get hairy. Right. Absolutely. Now you, you guys come across to me, come, come across as, you know, you're, you're, you're doing some right things. Right. And I would love to know, you know, just for, for us guys who are listening, you know, what can we do in our relationships to strengthen those bonds in the good seasons and then the seasons where it just feels like winter is upon us. Yeah. So, and I think unfortunately, like from the outside, it definitely looks like there are some good things, which there are, and I'll share on that, but I have to show the whole thing, which is it's been really freaking hard. And both of us have not always handled it with grace and doing the right thing. Not. You know, um, I think at first it like, brought us close together, like right away. It was like, you know, we're in this together. And and then as you just go on and, you know, especially when you're dealing with it, as like a chronic illness. Um, the stress can, the stress just becomes really difficult. Um, and there's hard feelings too. Like I, I was, I never wanted to be cared for, right? Like she didn't want to be a caregiver. I didn't want to be dependent. And so that sets up a tough dynamic. You know, I was, resentful and and bitter at times and didn't treat her the way that I should. And and on the flip side, she's really struggled with anticipatory grief again, like kind of flip into the end. Like I know I'm going to, you, you, you protect yourself as uh, we've been together 30 years and and you, you really do protect yourself by sometimes putting up that wall. Like, I don't want to get closer to Trevor when odds are he's not going to be with me in a couple years. Like I I need to protect myself. This is already going to be too hard as it is to lose him. And so, you know, she puts up that wall to protect herself, which is normal. And, and I, and I, of course, and there's been times that I have turned away from our marriage, you know, um, because it's been too hard and that's just brutal honesty. And, but the great thing about us is that we've been able to look at those issues and say, all right, let's just reset. Like, okay, for today, like, do you choose to be here with me? (laughs) Yes, I do. Do you choose to be here with me? Yes, I do. Okay. So we know we've made mistakes. We know there've been hard feelings. How do we move forward? How do we get stronger? And, um, some counseling, some, some pretty awesome, uh, marriage, uh, books, you know, where we do exercises together. Like we'll sit down on a Sunday morning and go through some exercises from these books and, and drink our coffee, you know? And and so it's work. You know, there's, there's no magic. Like all of a sudden, if you get sick, it's like, there's no magic thing. That's going to just keep you together. Like a lot of marriages break down in the face of a challenge like this. And, but both of us have been, have been absolutely willing to say, this is worth it. And to say, we want to be together and let's do the things that are going to keep us together, but acknowledging the hardship, right? Like not minimizing that saying like, this is really stressful. This is really hard. Um, and lately since this past September, really, we have gotten, I would say closer than ever. And that is from doing the work and being intentional about it. Um, and communicating, holy crap, right? (laughs) That is that I think for a lot of marriages, that's, that's the thing. It's like, are we actually going to communicate our truths and are we going to actually stand up for our needs too, right? As individuals in this marriage. And I think I'm just really proud of I'm so grateful to Sarah again. Like I wouldn't be alive without her. She carried our family financially, emotionally, all the things when I was out of it and then continues to do those things. Every time I go into a major surgery and it's like that week and then a couple months of, of rehab, you know, so she has really carried us and me in a way that no one could ever be expected to. Um, so I just want to say thank you to her. Um, and I'm just really, we're in a really good place right now, six years in, 
Um, I still have active cancer. I had my last major surgery in November, but I still have a little bit of active cancer. I'm, I'm considered currently, I say currently incurable because science is always making advances. It, I keep extending my life and new treatments become available. New surgery options become available. So science, the scientists would tell me that, that the odds of me living much longer are pretty low, but, um, I'm not one to listen to the odds. You know, that, that attitude serves you well, serves you well, Thanks, no matter what the outcome. Right. Right. right? I mean, it's cause I mean, we can, we can either, we can go one direction or the other when it comes to our attitude. And I just want to honor you for, for sharing your story, man. And, and I want to make sure guys can support you. So wh where is the best place for men to find you? And especially for our guys out there that listen to the podcast who have a diagnosis like yeah, this. Absolutely. I mean, they can reach out to me all the time individually, Trevor at man up to cancer.org. Um, and also just, just go, to go to our website that has all the information about all the stuff we do, um, is man up to cancer.org. Yeah. I, uh, I went there before we actually got started today and, and you've got just tremendous amount of resources on your site. Uh, it looks like you guys do retreats as well. Yep. So that's our biggest, biggest program is the retreat. And also you'll see just, we have awesome, the, the number of guys who are out there sharing their stories, being brave and, and sharing about the whole thing and being role models. That's really what this is all about. So yeah, yeah. man up to cancer.org. Check us out, hit me up. Um, you know, some people just listen to my podcast or check out our social media. Others join the community and, and take part in it. So um, uh, the, that, the biggest man. message is just that other, other guys are going through this. If you, if you want to, uh, you know, and, and it's not just our community, right? Like my message is like, whether you join man up to cancer or any other community, like, like you and I, Larry just, just talked about, you know, doing nothing's not an option, st st you know, isolating's not an option. So whatever it is, get out there and, and start engaging. I love that, man. Yeah. I, isolating is not an option. <laughs> And that, I'm, I'm going to remember that quote. My my greatest mentor who introduced me to community, right, back in 2015, he was the one that quoted isolation as the enemy of excellence. Love that. And I'm using that too. So true, yeah, man. man. Well, guys, you won't have to look far if you want to connect with Trevor. Head on over to thedadedge.com forward slash Friday 151 for this show. Again, thedadedge.com forward slash Friday 151 for this show. Trevor, thank you so much for coming on and, and blessing us with your message. And uh, your mission, I just thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm 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 a huge fan of you. I'm man. a huge fan of yours. Thank you for your work, and uh, it's an honor to be on with you.